Oh, you're hilarious, dear. I meant to, I was going to turn my phone on to do not disturb, and Jamie sent me a text and says, do you know where Miss Arlinthia's new house is? Yesterday at 10.58 a.m. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, what, what was that message by Pastor Jackson some years ago, keeping score? Sounds like somebody's keeping score. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I did get yours, yes, sir. Um, uh, one I appreciate, the other I do not. Uh, <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, the Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Be also, Heavenly Father, help us to invest in the future, invest in eternity. Lord, we know you are not anti-stuff. You are anti-stuff as priority. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. Wood, hay, stubble, the Bible says um, that uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, where all of our deeds are put onto the altar, will be tried by fire, God's trial fire that he'll that uh, will will um uh, try our works to see what sort they are are they wood hay stubble or gold silver precious stone uh wood hay stubble is uh the best way i heard it was this what you do on earth for earth that's wood hay stubble what you do on earth for earth and then gold silver precious stones are what you do on earth for heaven what you do on earth for heaven. And I always, um, I always wondered about that. I was like, well, you know, how do I know what I'm investing in my life? I know soul winning's good. Um, I know um, uh, teaching the Bible's good. That's got to be some gold silver. But it's anything you do with the intention of eternity, uh, whether it's um, helping the poor, feeding the poor, um, helping the, the fatherless and the widows, and indeed, the Bible says, and having compassion, and some having compassion making a difference, and um, uh, whatsoever you've done unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And um, uh, love the Lord your God, and, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Hang all the hang all the law and the prophets on these two commandments. So it's a huge deal on how we treat others and our walk with God. So yeah, you may be saved. Uh, I, I read um, a message by Brother Spurgeon this morning called um, uh, "Self Destroyed but Saved." Self-destroyed but saved. And a lot of people are going through your life and you may be the hot dog on the block, so to speak. I mean, you may be the, bit, you may be the person in charge. You may have, you may have the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the highest income in the building or in the church. You may be famous. You may be popular. You may be good looking. But if you're not doing jack for the, if you're not doing anything for the Lord, your life really accounts for nothing. Amen. Sure, you make it to heaven, but okay, good, great. But what did you do for the Lord? You lived a life that was consumable. I don't want that the life of Jake Jackson to be completely consumable. I know that there is. I, I've lived some of my life, I'm sure, and I'm sure I will still invest in wood, hay, stubble. Guys, I like guns, and I like cars, and I like fishing poles, and um, I like vacations, and uh, um, I don't have any of those things, but I, no, I, I like them. I like to look through the magazines, amen. Uh, I like to, I, you know, I like those things. I like a new suit. I like a new pair of shoes. I like a watch. You know, I, I like stuff, but it's what you do on earth for earth and what you do on earth for heaven. Now, we are instructed in the Bible to let, listen, we're not told that we're going to have them. We're told to lay them up. We're not just told that they're accounting. We're told to actively lay up treasures in heaven. A treasure is something that has value, something that has value. And from, uh, from Matthew chapter 6, we can understand that there are two kinds of treasures. Does anybody remember what the two kinds are? Look. Okay, there you go. Temporal and eternal. Temporal and eternal. Two kinds of treasures, temporal and eternal. Um, and obviously the temporal can be destroyed and the eternal cannot be destroyed. Now we say, well, how do we know what's valuable and what isn't? How do we know what's valuable and what isn't? Anybody ever had something appraised before? You've had something appraised where they came along who was an expert in that area and they had parameters of what the car or what the jewelry or what the home or whatever the, 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 the antique was worth or whatever the case of painting. And, you, and they said, okay, this is what it's worth. And they told you, this is what it's worth. 
Okay, so God says, this is what it's worth. God is the appraiser, and the Bible is the appraisal book. God is the appraiser, and the Bible is the appraisal book. Now, the Word of God appraises everything in life, absolutely everything. It tells you what you're, what you're worth, what your life is worth. It tells you everything. Now, the Bible is the only thing that tells you what a soul is worth. There is no book out there, unless it's based on the Bible, that will tell you how much a soul is worth. Um, uh, the world does not appraise a soul at the same value that Jesus appraises a soul. It does it much differently. The Bible says in Luke 12, 16 through 20, uh, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground, of a certain, uh, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, right? Come on, so if, this, if the ground brought forth plentifully, what did the guy do? He worked that field, didn't he? He plowed it and worked it, and I'm sure he might have had some employees, but he, he kept the pests away, and he made sure that that field brought forth plentifully. In that alone, we have the law of sowing and reaping. The Lord blessed the labor of this man. It did. The earth, the earth brought forth abundantly and plentifully, the Bible says, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He's saying, man, I got no room for all the stuff I have. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits of my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much, uh, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said. So here this man is. He had this great harvest, and he made an account. He made an appraisal. He said, wow, look how valuable. This is wonderful. But God said, but God said, thou, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall those, uh, 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 those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. And is not rich toward God. God is all about riches, but rich toward whom? Where are your riches? Toward yourself, toward your group, toward your clique, toward your, you know, your 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 your, uh, your um, uh, uh, peers, or are you rich toward God? God, uh, verse twenty said, but God said, but God said, that immediately makes me think of boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth, because God may say, I've got different plans. God is the appraiser. So if we're going to balance life. Life is about balance. We have to find balance. You can't be all work. You can't be all play. Uh, uh, they'll both lead you astray. You have to find a balance in life. If we're going to live life with purpose, if we're going to live life with joy, we're going to live it with meaning and be people of substance, we're going to have to learn what is valuable and what is not valuable. What is valuable and what isn't valuable. Uh, many times I've ran across things in, in, in my life, and maybe you have too, where you come across something and go, whoa, 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 is that what I think it is? And then you get, oh, and then you're like, oh, that's not valuable at all. Oh, man, it's nothing. That's nothing. Uh, you know, somebody told me, don't ever walk with your, with your head down. Don't, don't walk, with your head, walk with your head high. If I walked with my head high, I would have missed out on $10 bills and $20 bills and $5 bills and scratch off tickets that were winners. Uh, you know, I've walked by and, uh, you know, to pick, just to pick up trash. And I look at that ticket and go, hey, man, that's, that's 20 bucks. I went inside and put it on the counter. And he's like, here's your 20 bucks. I'm like, see what you get for walking around with your head down? Um, it was in prayer, of course. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but God said, God said, so if we want to live a, a sustainable life, a, a quality life, a substantial life, we have to learn what is valuable and what isn't. Now, think of uh, the, 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 like the major areas of our life, uh, our walk with God, our walk with um, uh, our spouse, our being a parent, and our, our jobs, and our health, and our wealth. If we think about those things, we have to find a balance in those things, balance in those things. So I asked you, I asked you two weeks ago, where, ask yourself, where do you spend your time? Where are you spending your time? How much time are you spending on those things? Hobbies and interests and um, uh, whatever they may be, but ask yourself, where am I spending my time? And then we came to the point. Point number one, obedience to principle takes time. Obedience to principle takes time. Uh, there are some people who can just adapt, just, oh, okay, that's what I'll do then. 
Oh, no, nope, I'm not going to do that anymore. Oh, I'll do that anymore. Uh, and, and sometimes it's hard because things in life are strongholds. You've been doing something your whole adult life, and then all of a sudden you develop this relationship with the Lord, and the Bible says don't do that, or, man, you shouldn't walk that, you shouldn't talk that way, you shouldn't think that way. And you're like, oh, man, I, I didn't know that. So obedience to principle takes time. It takes time to develop the character we need to, um, uh, to walk with the Lord and to adapt to the Bible. The Bible says in Galatians, uh, or no, excuse me, uh, point number one is it takes, it's, it, it takes time. It takes time. Uh, uh, obedience to principle takes time. Obedience to principle takes time. And number two, obedience takes all the time we have. Obedience to principle takes time, but obedient, obedience takes all the time we have. See, there's no time in the Bible where God says, okay, now you can be disobedient. There's not a time where I tell my children, um, this is what I want you to do, this is how long I want you to do it, and after that, you can be hooligans and crazy and do whatever you want. No, <laughs> they know things that, would, that dad and mom would frown upon. There are things that we would just look at them and be like, come on, man. There is not an okay time to disobey. Obedience takes all the time you have. The Christian life is not something that you add to the life you had. The Christian life is something you now live by. It's not some, oh, I am, I am this person, and now I'm going to add Christianity into it. No, nope, Christianity is its lifestyle. When you say, okay, I am now a believer in Jesus, like I said this morning, I want you as my Savior, but I don't want you as my Lord. Lord, tell me how to get to heaven, but don't tell me how to live. Tell me how to stay out of hell, but don't tell me what to do. Come on now. You're, missing, you're, you're shortchanging yourself. Because when we say, okay, Lord, okay, God, uh, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I, I believe on him. I put my faith in him. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, so therefore I am saved, as your word has said. So here I am in Christ. Now, it's not, there is Christ over there, and I am over here, and I visit him on Sundays. No, nope, he's right here. Uh, I said it several years ago, learn to obey every spiritual impulse. Learn to obey every spiritual impulse. We give in to those fleshly ones. My body tells me all, all the time, hey man, you want that caffeine? Hey man, you want that sugar? Hey man, you want that pizza? <laughs> hey man, you want that, you want those tacos? Hey man, you want those tacos? Hey, man, you want those tacos? Okay, you get the point. Uh, all the time, my flesh is like, you want that, you want that, you want that. Do you know you have another voice in you? He's called the Holy Spirit of God, and he says, give that person a gospel track. Go to church today. Put your tithe in. Tell somebody about Jesus. Get involved in a ministry. And we, we're pros at telling him no, but we tell ourselves yes all the time. Okay, I'm not, again, I'm not rebuking you. I'm just saying, hey, let's pay attention to what's going on because the Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, man, I want to, but I am so weak in the flesh. And then flip that on its head. The flesh is willing to do these things for the flesh, but the Holy Spirit of God, I haven't given him enough authority in my life to be strong enough for me. The spirit's weak in me. Vice versa. The Bible says, uh, uh, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. One of the major problems we have in the Christian life is trying to figure out who owns us. Who's in charge? Who's the boss? Who's the boss? Folks, you just you, you can't be saved for a decade and still be asking that question. You will battle. You will fight. You will say, man, Lord, I want a hold of the steering wheel today. Uh, and then you'll get through the day and go, Lord, I probably shouldn't be in the driver's seat. <laughs> Lord, you take back over. Uh, who owns me? What? No, you're not. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Get that very clearly right now. Stop it with your... Um, uh, uh, your ultra Americanism and become an ultra child of God and a kingdom heir and stop being so American that you forget that you're a Christian. 
He said, I am pro-America, I love America, but America one day will turn on the chosen nation, Israel, and turn its back on Israel, and America will be cast into the depths of hell with every single other nation who has turned and forgotten God. I don't have such an allegiance to America that God, listen, when we hang a Christian flag out here, I know, you know, the American flag goes, no, listen, they don't, they don't fly that way in my heart. God flies up here and my family flies here and America is about the 10th on the agenda. God, family, country. God, family, country. And God bless our boys and God bless our soldiers and God bless the people who defend this nation. I love America and the freedom it provides me. But this world's not my home. I'm passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere uh, beyond the blue. I've laid up treasures in heaven. America says, Jackson, you earn it. God says, I'll earn it for you. Just walk this way. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, no, I appreciate you. I've told you to do that, and I've told you to do that. One of these days, you'll get with the program. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, I, I love America. I'm all about America. I am pro-patriot. I, man, my heart sings and rings with uh, the Star Spangled Banner and my country, Tis of Thee, and, and uh, the red, white, and blue. And, and I went to Norfolk, Virginia. I was able to see the ships out there and see all kinds of things. I love America. But God did not die for America. He died for the world. And it's our job to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And what am I doing? I'm not my own. I'm not sure. I, I got saved and I was made a son. And I decided to serve under my father and become a servant and a steward. But I'm not just those things. I'm not wearing a silk somewhere, lounging throughout the kingdom. I got a sword in my hand. I got a shield in my hand. I got on the whole armor of the gospel of God. And I want to be out on the battlefield making a difference for my Lord. That's what I want to be doing. That's what every Christian ought to be pursuing to do because they're not their own. When God says, don't do that, you shouldn't do that. When God says, go do that, you should do that. I was talking to Brother Joe and Miss uh, Renee Van Buren. Um, uh, Friday night, dear? Friday night. And we we're talking about personal conviction. Personal conviction. And many times we Christians think convictions are biblical principles against worldly things. In most, yes, in most cases. But did you know the Lord could call on you to stop drinking coffee? The Lord could tell you to, hey man, you know, I'm not comfortable, you know, maybe you shouldn't drive that Mercedes to church every Sunday. Now, we don't have that problem right now. But, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but and you say, well, is it, is it wrong to have a Mercedes? No. Is it wrong to drink coffee? No. If you're a Mormon, yes, you shouldn't. But I, I, if, um, uh, I think, is it Mormons? Yeah, Mormons. Um, uh, 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 is it wrong for some of these things? No, there's nothing wrong with them, but God says, I want you to stop doing that. Lord, why would you want me to do that? Sometimes he'll give you an answer, sometimes he won't. You remember that, the story about my dad? He said he was, in, um, uh, he was in college, First Baptist Church. He had 10 bucks in his pocket or something like that. And it was a couple gallons, back in the day when 10 bucks would go someplace, it was breakfast, a newspaper, and a couple gallons of gas. And he said that he felt like the Lord wanted him to come off that 10 bucks and give it to the guy behind him. And my dad said, come on, no, it's my last $10. I don't want to give it to that guy. I don't know that guy. Lord, you know what it's for. I have $10. I planned on that. I'm looking forward to spending that 10 bucks more than I am listening to Brother Hiles preach today. I am looking to forward to that breakfast in that newspaper. But he said, Jackson, I'll give it. Give it, give it. So he said after a battle with the Holy Spirit, he decided he was going to give it. And as soon as he said, all right, Holy Spirit, I'll give it, the Holy Spirit said, no, I don't want you to. You don't want me to. What is that all about? Oh, I suppose I just want to see if you are willing. I just want to see if you are willing. I remember there was a time we still lived on Elmwood that my dad thought God was calling him to go to the mission field in the Philippines. I was like, no, no. And then Miss uh, Miss um, Ray Costanilla, she told me she said, "You'd be a star over there, Jake." I'm like, all right, let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, but that didn't happen, and now I'm not a star. Uh, but uh, uh, she said, oh, they love you over there, tall white boy, you know, America. And I'm like, all right, sounding a little bit better. <laughs> um, but uh, he, why, why? Why does God sometimes call us to do things that we go, that doesn't make any sense? Because he wants to see if you're willing to obey him. There was a man named Abraham who had a son named Isaac. 
And God said, take him up to the mountain. I want you to sink a heart, sink a, a knife into his chest and kill him. And Isaac was like, or Joe, uh, uh, Abraham had, was what? what? This is the son that you promised me. I was a hundred, Lord. <laughs> a hundo, and my wife was 99 when we had this kid. Come on now. And you're going to take him from me? He got him all the way to the point of binding him and laying him on the altar and having the dagger in the air. And the Lord said, now I know you trust me. We all think that God knows my heart. Yes, but God's going to test that knowledge. God's going to say, yeah, I know your heart, but I'm going to test it. If you read the book of Job, and right now I'm, I'm doing something, I encourage everybody to do it. Everybody ought to do this. Um, a, a portion of scripture that catches your attention, that grips you, read it over and over and over and over and over and over again. I read Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, uh, 12 times last week. And one thing after another, after another, after another, after another just came boom, 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 popping off the page. I was, whoa, blew my mind. When the, the Bible says that, that, that Satan came walking up into him from the earth, present himself before the Lord, and the Lord, hey, Satan, where'd you coming from? And he said, I was walking down the earth, you know, you know what, what I always do, Lord. I haven't really got any place to go or do, you know. And, and the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, yeah, man, you put a hedge about that guy. He doesn't fear you. Does he fear you for naught? And God said, all right, I'll take the hedge down. Go ahead and see what's up with him. You see, God knew what Job was all about, but he tested it anyway. You say, well, God knows my heart. God knows that I love him. And God knows, oh, really? God knows that you love him? God knows that uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. And you may feel that, and you may really believe that, singing it in the pew with your comrades in the pew, in, in the congregation. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Oh, really? What about when you're alienated from your family and your friends and your job stinks and you're feeling alone? Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. You see, because he is valuable. He is worth forsaking all. He is worth forsaking all. Lucas, if it came down to Jesus or you, I sure hope I'd choose Jesus. Same thing with all my, and I love my boys. Like, I love my boys. Like, it's a rough bunch, and I love it. I love it. I love it. Being a dad, like I dreamed about being a dad when I was a kid. I didn't really think much about being a husband. I just wanted to be a dad. <laughs> I didn't quite know how all that worked at that time, but I wanted to be a dad, you know, and, and the husband thing, I just kind of happened. Uh, but uh, man, I wanted to be a dad, and uh, I'm a dad. I'm a dad five times over, and I love my boys. I love it. I love being, um, uh, uh, some days I love being a truck driver. Most days I hate it, but man, I, I like the open road sometimes. Sometimes, man, going, uh, coming down some of those mountains, and you can just see out in um, New Mexico and, uh, and Arizona for miles and miles and miles. Texas, you get stinking west, stinking. You get west of, uh, uh, west of Amarillo, and it's big sky country out there. You just feel swallowed up by the sky. It's coming out of Flagstaff, Arizona, and just stars everywhere blew my mind. Come through Oklahoma and a mediator, uh, me, mediator, I mean, Jesus came across, a meteor came across, burned up in the atmosphere, some, some cool stuff out there. Man, it's beautiful to get out there and see those things. And I love it. The experiences are great. It's the same thing with being a dad. It's got its highlights. Same thing with being a husband. It's got its highlights. But most of the time, it's like, this is hard. I got to figure things out. I got to do these things. But if I do it, the way that God has told me to do it from the appraisal book, I can make my I can make my um, uh, uh, my marriage. I can make my parenting. I can even make my. Um, I said it a few weeks ago. You may not like where you're employed. You may not like what's going on. You may not like your income. You may not say. You may say, "Man, I've got more in the tank. I've got more to offer, and I feel like I'm, uh, my talents aren't being utilized." Work there, like you're working for the Lord, and let God give you the promotion. Let God give you, let God direct your ways. Let God work it all out for you. Why? Because you don't belong to yourself anyway. You ought to always consult with God through prayer and consult with godly men and women in your life who can help you make the right decisions. Why? Because you're not your own and you want to please God with your decisions. You want to please God with your decisions. Number one, number one, it takes time. Or, uh, obedience to principle takes time. Number two, obedience 
takes all the time that we have. And then life, uh, uh, number three, life gets out of balance when people spend time chasing things that cannot be obtained. Life gets out of balance when people spend time chasing things that cannot be obtained. Uh, uh, a lot of Christians um, are uh, uh, like the cartoons, uh, Coyote and Roadrunner. That guy, as far as we know, he's still chasing him. He's never caught him. I think I saw him out there in Arizona somewhere chasing him. Uh, he's chasing him everywhere. You, you can't catch him. You're going to try and try and try and try, but you can't catch him. Now, do you know what? Here's the thing. I don't want, I don't want to live uh, the American dream. I don't, I don't want the American dream. I want God's dream for me. When God formed me in the womb, God had a vision for me. God had a dream for me. I don't want to live my life obtaining cars and homes, and I like cars and I like homes and boats and motorcycles and, and um, stuff. I like stuff just like anybody else, just like anybody else. But I don't want to set my affection on it. Um, I believe it was in a book. I've, I've quoted it a few times now. Uh, Bob Gray was a child, and he was moving. Uh, and uh, their, their moving van, their stuff, I don't know what it was. I, I don't know the, quite the situation I recall correctly. But all of their stuff burned up, burned up. And I remember Brother Gray saying from his childlike mind, he could remember his toys and his blankets and his things burning up. And he began to cry. And Bob Gray's mother said to him, don't worry, Bobby. God didn't burn up in the fire. God didn't burn up in the fire. So we can suffer great loss, but God didn't burn up in it. God didn't sink. God didn't die. God didn't burn up. The God who takes away is the same God who can give again. That's what Job said to his wife when she said, curse God and die, Job. Job said, you speak as one of the foolish women speaketh. Should we receive good at the hand of God and not evil? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There's a time and a season and a reason for everything that we experience under the sun. Every one of them. But the more and the closer you walk with God and the more that you keep your life in balance, chasing the things that matter, you won't ever get out of balance. There's some people right now, I want to grab them and I want to shake them and I want to say, don't you see? Don't you see what you're doing to your life and your family? Don't you see where you're headed? Don't you see it? And they don't see it. You want to know why? Because their life is out of balance. You see, one, the, one of the saving graces for Jake Jackson when he was backslidden, hard-hearted, and, 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 and messing with sin is that I stayed in church almost three times a week. You say, really, you credit church that much? Yes. You want to know why? Because it gave me a balance. I'm not saying juggle sinful living and, and, and Christian living. I'm saying if you're going to have that, if you're going to be juggling that sinful Sinful ball or sinful baton, you might as well put a you might as well put a, 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 a Christian one in there. You might as well put something spiritual in there. I'll tell you what, I, and I know Brother Lenny can testify to it. Knocking on his door on Sunday morning, it was really hard to wake him up sometimes. And I, that's, I'm not bringing any, anybody's past up. But it's and, and it's same thing for me, same thing for some of you in this room. Where you like, dude, I partied hard the night before, but I got to counterbalance that. <laughs> I got to counterbalance that. Uh, there have been so many times. Uh, what, what, it was um, uh, when was that? Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, going through that snowstorm, I put on my my bib overalls and my big old boots and bundled up, and I still was soaked and cold and freezing. I did not drive the three hours home from Indianapolis in those clothes. I got out of them. What did I do? I was freezing. I was wet and I was cold. I put on warm clothes. I balanced it out. I balanced it out. A lot of Christians, what they do, and there's several of them, many of them I grew up with, some of them older than me, some of them younger than me, who are living out of balance right now because they started chasing things they will never obtain. They want to chase popularity. You're not going to get it. I think God will resist you from getting it. I think God, God's not going to let you get it. And if you do get it, you do get it, you'll be found, it's, you find out it's, it's empty. It's fool's gold anyway. It's fool's gold. Life gets out of balance when we spend time chasing things that can't be obtained. I don't want to live the American dream. I'm all for people who want to do it. You want to do it. And that's, that's what I say about people. Oh, you've rejected Christ? Okay, then this is as good as it gets for you. You live in a world with cancer and rape and murder and prisons and cemeteries and nursing homes. 
there were five police officers who, who beat to death a man in Memphis just a week or two ago, or a month ago or so. Scandals, political rot, the swamp, they say. Uh, um, uh, uh, just deceitfulness and, and, and espionage and spying and nuclear warheads all across the planet. This is your heaven. This is as good as it gets. But for the Christian, put upon me cancer, put upon me death. Let me see my children pass away. Let me see my, my wife slowly deteriorate from cancer like Brother Robin Smith's wife did. Let me see my children pass away as um, uh, uh, Brother Bill Grady lost his son just a month or two ago. And, and uh, uh, Brother Joe Miller lost his wife and lost his son Josh who were in heaven. And, but this is as bad as it gets for the born-again Christian. This is as bad as it gets. And, and I know well, it could always be worse. It could. But for the child of God, it gets no worse. It gets no worse than what this world can offer. And this world can offer some pretty bad stuff. There are Christians who are in prison camps right now today. There are Christians who are in prison, Christians who are being persecuted, Christians who are in hiding. They dare not carry their Bible. They dare not present a cross. They dare not speak the name of Jesus as holy deity. They'll be killed for it. But this is as bad as it gets. Folks, I'm gonna tell you today, quit dreaming about the mansion. Quit dreaming, brother uh, Alex and I went soul winning on um, uh, in the Foster Park area and Old Trail Road and different things yesterday. And um, we almost started talking about the middle class and saying to the middle class, I said, the middle class is what builds a church. I said, rich people do not sustain your church and poor people do not sustain your church. It's the middle working class. It's a middle working class who have the work ethic in them. And I'm not saying Poor folks don't contribute, and I'm saying rich folks don't contribute. I'm saying that sustainable, manageable middle are, are middle-class people. And he said, you know, almost, it's almost like middle-class people are slaves. He said, no, bro, we are. They are. We are. Slaves to a way of living. Slaves to keeping up with the Joneses. Man, there was one house, huge. I'm talking like the square footage of that thing was massive. And I was man, that's crazy. Look at that thing. And I... If you gave me the keys to that, I wouldn't go, oh, no, thank you. I'd be like, yeah, baby, I'll take that. Um, this is my wing. Everybody else, that's your wing. <laughs> um, uh, I'm open for visitation um, from Monday, on Mondays from 1 to 115. <laughs> that's about it. Uh, I'm not against that. I love that stuff. Man, I, told, I showed him one house. So there's a house over there. It uh, looks like a castle and all kinds of And we stopped and we talked to people and just had a good time. But um, if you're living for those things, that's American dream. Okay, so you, you got it, and, and now you have to maintain it. Woo! That's a, that's a hard task. That's a hard task. Uh, uh, I want to live, and I want to chase something that's, that's, uh, that, that's never going to lose its value. I want to chase after Jesus. I want to obtain Jesus, uh, and I've obtained him with salvation, but I want to obtain him with wisdom and with understanding and with compassion. Uh, I, want to make, I want to make a difference. I'm so, I'm, I'm, my, my thing this year, as I told Brother Alex yesterday, so on, my thing this year is converts, me personally, converts and baptisms, I've got to have some. I've got to have some. I can't, I can't be doing this. I can't. I can't. Just hold the title of pastor and not bear any fruit. Hang that garbage. God, you, either you go with me and go before me or I'm not going. Moses said, Lord, go before me and go with me or I don't, or I don't want to go. Lord, I don't want to continue to be a pastor if you're not going to give me converts. And I'll just say it out loud right now. I'll call myself to the carpet and call God to the carpet right now and say, God, give me some converts this year. I want some real deal converts. I want some people walking the aisle. I want some people showing up that I invited. I want some people getting dunked in that water. I want to see some lives changed. I want to see some drug addicts quit. I want to see some, uh, uh, some rich people come in here, amen, and say, I renounce my trust in riches and I trust in Christ and let's buy a bus. Let's put a roof on this place. Listen, I believe in a God who can and who will do great big giant things if people will just have faith in him and enough not just to believe on him, but to believe in what he still can do. He's a God who does great big mighty things. But the world says, just come along and follow me. Just come along and follow me. A bunch of rats with the Pied Piper. I ain't no rat. I'm a child of God, and I want to listen to the tunes of heaven and not what the tune the devil is playing. Hang that mess. And we just go right after and say, boy, that's what I want to get. That's the kind of car I want to drive. I, just got, man, I haven't had my car since July. It'll feel like a brand new car once I get it again. I had to go chase it down. 
where's my car, Gerber? Where's my car? They said, oh, it's over here. We're getting, uh, and I told him, I said, listen, I will approve aftermarket headlights. He told me, uh, Cadillac is trying to find a new um, manufacturer for their headlights, blah, blah, blah. I said, dude, put in aftermarkets. Give me my car. He said, he laughed. He's like, you'll ride off on that? You'll sign off? I said, yes. Yes, I will. Why don't y'all just call me and ask? Give me my car. I like my car. But, man, when we hit that stupid deer down in Oklahoma, I got out and shot that thing. <laughs> Laying on the side of the road like, ah. It's like, well, God bless you. Pow! But I, I didn't really do that. Um, it was already did. Um, <laughs> I promise. Um, but um, I got out in the car. I said, you know, it's just a car. It's just a car. It's just a car. Um, uh, and I don't put my stock in that. I Jamie backs into a tree with the Cadillac and messes up the bumper. Then Bob slams into the back of it. And like, you know what? I'm, whatever. I don't care if the bumper falls off. I don't care. <laughs> Um, but what's the, man, the devil's got us running around and around and around and around in life, and he gets you tired, and he takes the best from you and lets you leave the rest for God. God, I gave my best. Here's the rest. You see, we need to stop thinking Monday is the beginning of the week. It's not. Sunday is. Sunday's the beginning of the week. Give God your best on Sunday. Give God your best on Sunday. The devil's got us running around. We're tired and we don't go any, we're not any further than we are, than we were five years ago. We feel like I keep missing the exits in life. I keep missing my chances because the devil's got us chasing things that can't be obtained. I don't want to leave the American dream. I want to live the will of God. I want to live the will of God. And you should want to live the will of God. You should say, what is the will of God? And I'm going to understand it and I want to know it the best I can. I'm going to listen to the preaching. I'm going to try to obey it. I'm going to do what the Bible says. I want to live the will of God for my life. And it can take you through the valley of the shadow of death. And it can take you to the mountaintops. And it can make you fill the valley full of ditches. And it can make you uh, 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 take 300 up against 30,000. And it can make you do all kinds of crazy things. But God will always see you through when you do the will of God and you Live the will of God. I love America, but hang the American dream. Obtaining the American dream is going through a nightmare. I want to live the will of God. I want to live in the will of God. And I know many people do too, and there's no way I'm going to be able to, to finish this. Um, but uh, we have to be able to accept God's appraisal of the things of life, things that are important, things that are valuable. Uh, uh, folks, I want to tell you tonight, don't wait till you're dying to recognize the things that are valuable. When you're on your deathbed, you said, man, I, would, I, I wish I would have spent more time visiting my Sunday school class and really getting to know them. I wish I would have spent more time with my family instead of being there but not being there. Many moms and dads are home, but they're not home. Mom goes there, dad goes there, kid goes there, other kid goes there, and we all live in the same place but separate lives. Be there. Be there. Don't wait until your dying days to recognize that. Don't wait until the doctor says, I think you've got cancer, or I know you have cancer, and this is how much time you have to live. And to start evaluating our life, let's evaluate it today. Let's evaluate it tonight. Look at your life. Go home. Look in the, the mirror, so to speak. Look inside your soul and say, I've got to decide what's important. Start living towards that. Lean in to what you do well for the Lord. Lean into it. Start giving your life to the things that count. We've let the world and the social norms and the new normal of life appraise the value of life. And I'm telling you right now, tonight, the world is wrong. The world is wrong. The world is wrong. You're tired and you don't have to be. You're weary and you don't have to be. You're burdened and you don't have to be. You're stressed and you don't have to be. You're, you're, you're uh, uh, full of cares that Nobody cares about, and you don't have to be. You don't have to be. Sometimes people get tax assessments, tax assessments, and they look at that and go, that's too high. <laughs> that is way too high. That is too high. And by the way, any tax assessment is always too high. <laughs> it's always too high. Uh, the IRS should have been abolished some time ago, but shh, they're a bit very quiet. There might be one of the 87,000 agents listening. So um, <laughs> we've let the social norms reassess our values in life, and they are wrong. The world is wrong. 
social norms are wrong. We've gone through a great change in America, huge change in America concerning the value of a child. That we've begun to mess with kids, groom kids. Our world is becoming increasingly perverted. But folks, when we left the Bible, we left the things that were valuable. When we left the Bible, and by the way, you may have, people say, we kicked God out of school. (laughs) No, you didn't. No, you didn't. He's in the corner just hushed. You didn't kick God out of schools. You can't kick God out of anywhere. We kicked God out of school. You may have shut down the Bible. You may have shut down public prayer, but you didn't shut God down. His will be done. And when we kicked, when we, when we silenced God, we silenced the things that were valuable. You know, they have all these music shows, these talent shows with people who have incredible voices. I still think one of the most amazing voices that ever sang, uh, who had an incredible, just a pure, almost angelic voice. I never, I didn't grow up listening to her, obviously. Um, but um, uh, just hearing, even now in our culture, is Whitney Houston had an incredible voice. Incredible. Anybody familiar with Whitney Houston? Incredible voice. Whoa. Uh, pretty valuable, pretty famous, on the road to success and fame and things like that. And God takes something that is valuable, like the world takes something valuable, and he says, look, here it is. This is, my val- this is what's valuable. And we reject it. We say, oh, that's real gold. And we turn away from real gold, and we go to things like the masked singer or something, something stupid. And we like it for its entertainment value. We don't really like it for its real value. And the Bible has real value. I, I feel sorry for people who think it's just stories and made-up mythology. Like, guys, don't you, you don't know history at all. What did you, did you graduate high school? What was your GPA? <laughs> you didn't do well in history class, did you? The Bible is, it's, it's, it's the words of God. The words of, the words of God. Folks, there is nothing more valuable for the Christian than this. Let's determine what is valuable. So next week, I'll finish. (laughs) I'll try to finish up next week. Determine what is valuable. Heavenly Father, help us not to live wasted lives. Help us to invest in eternity and the future. Uh, And Lord, I, I, I guess I get jumbled sometimes on how it all works, but I know that if I invest in souls, if I invest in ministry, if I invest in time, talent, and treasure in the things of God, for the will of God, for thy kingdom come, I know that there's something I guess we could call spillover that leads to material goods. And that's not the goal. Uh, I know it's not the goal. Uh, there are Christians who, who have relatively nothing and they're happy. And there are Christians who have pretty much have it all and they're happy. And then there are vice versa. There are Christians who have it all and they're unhappy and Christians who have nothing and they're unhappy. What's the difference? Where's the, what's the ingredient? Where is it? It's people determining what is valuable. And then living a blessed life. Joshua 1, 8, Psalm 1, 1, Jeremiah 10, 23. And the list goes of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It goes on and on and on about us lining our lives up, aligning our lives with the Bible and living by it your laws, your precepts, your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, living by them and living a life of obedience. Blessed people are always obedient people and not perfect, um, not mistake-free, not blemish-free. We all have our, not, not, well, they all have clean pasts and everything. That's just not true. God will take just about anybody. He'll take anybody who says, God, I'm going to, first I accept your son. I believe on him. Save me. And then I'm going to start living by that book, by what it's preached, by what's taught, by what I read. Holy Spirit, convict me. I'm going to live by that book. Then you bless those people. You bless them indeed, and you bless them for sure, laying up eternal rewards. 
Lord, I don't have a rich uncle. I don't have rich family members who's going to leave me an inheritance one day. So I've got nothing to look forward to. And Lord, I'm, I'm kind of glad I don't. I don't want to get my mind off of eternity. Uh, Lord, I, I'd ask that you would help us to invest in that, to be smart, be wise, and invest in the things of eternity. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wednesday, Wednesday, be in your spot. Wednesday, 7 o'clock. I will not be here. Um, I'll be in Florida enjoying the 80-degree weather. <laughs> uh, but uh, nobody laughed. Brother, Brother Lenny did because he, know, he knows. Uh, but um, uh, I will be back, uh, I'm thinking Friday afternoon. But then the week after is Brother, uh, brother uh, uh, Mark Bachman. So I, I, I'm really trying to make it here for that. So be here for that. Have a great and safe week.